So last week we had started talking about the geometry of motion near L1 and L2. Actually, we were looking at the linearized equations and we're taking this point of view if we're trying to understand what the dynamics looks like, what kinds of motions are possible. We're taking a dynamical systems point of view where you first look at the equilibrium points and try to understand the dynamics near them. And they might have some role in sort of the larger scale dynamics. Right now, we're looking at what I call the case three energy. That's the three body problem energy. So this is where the energy is less than that of L3, but it's greater than that of L2. So you have these two bottleneck regions, say, opening up near L1 and near L2, which would be, they're, they're going to be points along the x-axis in the rotating frame. And that's kind of what I'm showing here. And we're going to have to use a lot of different things. So not just calculus, but algebra, geometry, some linear algebra to try to get at what's going on here. This is the planar circular restricted three-body problem. Planar circular restricted three body problem. We're looking at a fixed energy level. This simplifies things because otherwise we've got four variables we have to look at x, y, and then if you want x dot and y dot, or just to clarify that they are separate, you could choose them separately, right? These are four variables that describe the phase space, meaning you pick. Any particular x, y, vx, vy, that's an initial condition. So it's an initial point. So it's got an x and y, plus it's got a particular vx and vy. So you've got some velocity. And if we were to, say, follow that forward, what will it do? I don't know. Maybe it goes around. You know, maybe it goes through and goes from the region around mass m1 to the region around mass m2. And to do that, it would have to pass through this equilibrium region around L1. So that's what we're going to be looking at is look at the equilibrium or because it it sort of gives the appearance of a, a bottleneck that looks like things might be getting squeezed through there. So we might also call that a bottleneck region. And um, add a fixed energy the three body energy. What that does is it means that the motion isn't completely open to be in this four dimensional space of these four variables. It's actually limited to be in just a three dimensional, uh, we would technically say subset or sub manifold of those uh, of the four dimensional phase space. So a 3D, we either call it an energy surface or energy sub manifold it just means a surface and we don't really have experience with four three-dimensional surfaces embedded in four-dimensional spaces but maybe we will by uh 8 p.m so i think last time i kind of quickly at the very end said some things about the geometry of the motion near l1 and l2 i want to take a little easier back up and uh, really carefully go through it. I'm going to treat them both in the same way. There's no, there's no big difference. Um, they have the same kind of geometry. And they're important because they play this kind of gatekeeper role. Things that go from the region around the mass M1 to the region around mass M2, they have to go through this L1 region. And if they're going to escape from M2 to you know, just sort of leaving the system, um, then again, you have to go through one of these regions. So it's really important to look at these equilibrium regions. So that's what we'll do. Last time we had talked about what the linearized equations of motion were. Um, I guess just starting with the, the full nonlinear equations of motion. If x dot equals vx, y dot equals vy, and then vx dot equals 
two vy minus partial u bar partial x u bar was this effective potential energy and then vy dot is negative two vx minus partial u bar partial y there's a question yeah go ahead dr ross you mentioned well um i guess uh, my question is like, if you're at a given energy level, so right now we're in between the L, what the energy for between two and three, um, yeah. is it guaranteed that all motion will eventually, any, any initial conditions will eventually get you to, to explore this whole space? Or can you have a set of initial conditions where say you only stay around M1, even though you are at the energy level that would allow you to escape? It's it's the latter. So yeah, just having the energy so that it's possible to explore the whole thing doesn't mean you will. There's um, there's sort of this large connected set in the energy submanifold, or I, I tend to call it the energy surface, called the chaotic sea. And you can if you start in there, then you'll sort of visit anywhere within that chaotic sea. But there's other sets of initial conditions where if you start on, on those, you may be on some kind of quasi-periodic orbit or periodic orbit that's stable. So for example, it's known that if this was the Earth-Moon system, there's a set of initial conditions where you'll be on some large orbit around the moon. It's not easily described by a Keplerian uh, orbital variables, but uh, it's, it's, it's stable. So there's no way that starting on there, you're gonna leave there. Oh, okay. So being on this, the 4D or sorry, the 3D surface is that's the necessary condition for being able to hop in and out of these areas. But if you're not on that surface, there are no guarantees. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. If we were in that case where the bottlenecks were shut, and that means energetically, you don't have sufficient energy to to do some kind of interesting transfer. But this is a regime where at least it is energetically possible, but there's there's other criteria and that's what we want to look at. Thank you. Yeah. So these were the full nonlinear equations. And then we, um, you can linearize this near equilibrium points. And if you look at the collinear equilibrium points like L1 and L2 and L3, this takes us to um, linearized equations near L1 or L2. And like I said, I'll treat them in the same way, but this gives us uh, X dot is VX. So we've, we've done We've done a transformation so that X is with respect to the equilibrium point. So that the, uh, so L1 or L2 is at the origin. So we're doing some transformation. This X on the right-hand side is not the same as the X on this, these left-hand side equations. So once we do that transformation, X dot is VX, y dot is vy, vx dot is still 2vy, and then we get a linear term. It's just plus a times x, and then vy dot is negative 2vx minus v uh, y, where a and b come from uh, analyzing the linear equations, they're both real. So A is greater than zero, B is greater than, they're both real and positive. So A is two mu bar plus one, B is mu bar minus one. Mu bar came from, this is mu, and then we have the absolute value of the location of the equilibrium point. I guess let's call that XL. The X location minus one plus mu raised to the third power plus 
one minus mu x l plus mu raised to the third power. So that comes from analyzing the linearized system. And it's pretty, you know, it's pretty simple, right? It's not that bad. So for this system, we could find the eigenvalues, right? This is a linearized system. So it's of the form, if you remember from last time, we said y equal, y dot equals a y. And here I'm saying that y is a vector that's got all of these x, y, vx, vy. And a is pretty simple. 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, A, 0, 0, 2, and then the last line is 0, negative B, negative 2, 0. We can calculate the eigenvalues of A. We did that last time. We got something that was called by quadratic and you get um, things that are plus or minus lambda where lambda was lambda is real so we get a real pair of eigenvalues and then plus or minus i nu where nu is real so a purely imaginary set and this means because of the existence of uh, something in the right half plane that means that overall this is considered unstable. And then some people would just end there and say, oh, it's an unstable equilibrium point. Let's just give up. But we're not going to give up. There's Because there's a lot more to find out. You can find out the geometry of solutions. And sometimes instability isn't so bad. If it weren't for that instability part, things would just sort of approach these equilibrium regions and then stay forever. Whereas instead, they can approach and then they can leave. You wouldn't be able to leave if there wasn't an unstable part. So, so what do we get from that? Well, we can get the eigenvalues, and we even got formulas for those last time. Um, you could get also, analytically, you can get eigenvectors. So for... Um, lambda plus lambda, the, there's a corresponding eigenvector. And last time I just said it was u1. I'm going to show what it is analytically. So this is one in the first slot. Um, so we're, just, we're normalizing it, not so that it's unit normal, but just so that the first entry is one. So the first entry is one, and then we have negative sigma which is some uh, of uh, something we can analytically find out, lambda, and then negative lambda sigma. And sigma is two lambda over lambda squared plus b, and it's greater than zero. So that's the eigenvector corresponding to the positive eigenvalue or the unstable uh, eigenvalue. So this would be an unstable direction. For negative lambda, the eigenvector is, I'll call it uh, u sub 2. And it's similar. This is 1. And then we have, instead of minus sigma, it's just sigma. And then we have minus lambda and minus lambda sigma. And sigma is the same. And it's sort of worth thinking about what does this, what do these directions mean? What does it look like? Well, if we were to look in that, that equilibrium region that's near, uh, say, L1. So here's L1. If you just look at the first two, that tells you the slope or the direction that the stable and unstable directions are. And um, I, th 
think I even found some numerical values for that just to help give us an idea. Yeah. So if we, if we, uh, if, for example, if we use the mu that corresponds to the Earth Moon system, that's about 0 0.0121. Um, then we can calculate what lambda is, what sigma is, and everything. So sigma is about 0 0.46. So how do we interpret this? What is U2? Well, for to find U1 and U2, I mean, let's try to write U2. So starting from L1, I'll go forward, say, one unit, and then... I go down by 0.46 of that same unit. So I get some kind of direction. And there's a positive and negative to that direction. So this would be, I would call this the span of U1. So it's some infinite line in space emanating from L1 and that is the unstable direction, meaning we could put some arrows on it, say, well, in general, things that approach L1 are going to depart in one of those two directions. Anytime you have a saddle point, there's going to be an unstable un unstable direction, and there's two branches, and corresponding. There, there's also going to be a corresponding uh, a stable direction. So if we look at the stable direction, that would be from, from U2, so we would do the same thing, go out one unit and then go up by sigma. And so that gives us the other direction. And you notice they're, right, they're mirror images of each other. This is span of U2, and that would be a stable. So I'll draw the arrows going inward. So in general, the type of motion you'll see is that if something approaches L1 and, and then leaves, it can cross those lines, but it'll generally approach from the bottom left and then go up to the upper right. If we go back to the bigger picture, kind of the global phase space picture, um, it's getting kind of cluttered here. What do we have? We have that near L1, there is going to be unstable directions, and then stable directions. So things will tend to kind of be circulating around M1 and M2 in a prograde pro sort of way. And that's consistent with the way that these eigenvectors are, are turning out, at least the projection onto position space. Right, we just looked at the first two, because that's the X and Y entry. What about the other two? Well, it's basic. It looks like lambda times the first thing. So if we have, oops, um, one and let's say negative sigma, the second part is just lambda times that, so that it's lambda and then negative lambda sigma. That means that the velocity is going to be lambda times the displacement in that direction. What do I mean? If we start at L1, and then we go out, say, to this distance here, and we start at that position, then the velocity will be along the same direction, and it'll just be scaled by lambda. One could do more with that, but let's, let's just leave that for now. So that's the, those are the eigenvectors that correspond to the, the stable and unstable directions. So we might say the, this would be actually unstable, unstable. And then the other one is stable. All right, what about the other two? That was for the real pair of eigenvalues. What about the imaginary pair of eigenvalues? Well, let's look at that. For the eigenvalue I nu, I'll just call it W. 
And if you just, if you were to calculate uh, analytically or even numerically, what's the eigenvalue corresponding, uh, eigenvector corresponding to this eigenvalue, you'll get something that has a mixture of real and complex components. So again, normalizing so that the first entry is one, we get one and then negative I tau, where tau is something we could get analytically. And then I new and then new tau, where tau, similar to the way that we could write sigma up here, we could write tau. Tau is negative. It looks very similar, similar structure. It's nu squared plus a over two nu with a negative sign in front. So this is always negative. Now, what you do when you have a complex eigenvector, um, and just note that for the the complex conjugate eigenvalue, there's a complex conjugate eigenvector. And so it'd just be, I'll just call that W bar. It's literally the complex conjugate of W here. What you do is you, you take W and you split it into its real and imaginary parts. So I'm gonna write this as um, it's one and then zero, zero, new tau plus I, zero, negative tau, new zero. And you give these names. I'll call this U and I'll call this V. If you haven't seen this before, this is the procedure you do when you have complex eigenvectors. But of course you have, your original system is real. So the matrix A is real. We want to be able to write everything in terms of uh, a real eigenspace. So from this, we get um, two, from W, we actually get two generalized eigenvectors. That's what they're called. You know, it doesn't cheapen them or anything. They just, they are what they are. So U will say that's the real part of W. V is the imaginary part of W. Um, and because we have a purely complex set of eigenvalues, maybe it isn't so clear yet, it should be later, but it's going to correspond to oscillatory motion. So if you think about what's going on here in terms of, let me do the picture of the kind of close up near L1 again. So I'm drawing, these are the that's the forbidden region. So we're kind of zooming in at, on the bottleneck. Here's L1. And just, um, if you were to just look at a, you're, you start at L1 and then you go a little bit in the U eigenvector direction, what would that mean? That would mean that you displace a little bit in X, but then you also have a corresponding V velocity. And if you started that as an initial condition, what you'll find is that at least for very small displacements, this will actually come back around and you get you can get an orbit. And this is sort of the, uh, the origin of the, what are called Lyapunov orbits, planar Lyapunov orbits, at least in the linearized regime. If you were to integrate this in the full equations of motion, maybe you'll get one oscillation and then you'd see that it goes away because they're very unstable, but it's oscillatory motion. And then if you're wondering, well, what about this thing? This means displacing in the Y direction a certain amount, and then there'll be a corresponding X velocity and still you'll get oscillatory motion. You won't get anything different. You still get just Lyapunov orbits. Uh, so this is sort of a preview of Lyapunov orbits. Uh, not Lyapunov. As a historical note, I don't think Lyapunov actually named these orbits. Lyapunov did a lot of work on the um, 
the study of dynamical systems in general and stability. I think these were just among the first periodic orbits that were discovered. And so they were named in honor of Lyapunov. If anybody knows the true history, maybe they can correct me, but I don't think he named these things in the three body problem. Uh, but they bear his name now. German, I mean, uh, not German, Russian, Russian mathematician and dynamicist. Okay. So that sort of gives us an idea of the meaning of these eigenvectors. But what you what you really want to do when you have a system is you want to you want to write it in the simplest way. And the eigenspace would be the simplest way to do this. So we're going to write the linearized equations. in the an eigenbasis. So what are we doing? Well, we're starting from y dot is a y. A is, a, in this case, four by four matrix. We want to transform to some new coordinates. not the original coordinates, but coordinates in the eigenbasis. What does that mean? Uh, well, we'll use R to represent uh, our coordinates in the eigenbasis. And to go from Y to R, we're going to use the inverse of a matrix P. So P represents a linear transformation. The way that you write P is you write the eigenvectors as column vectors. So we'll write U1, and these dots just mean we're writing it as a column. U2, written as a column, and then... Uh, U, right, that was the real part of the complex eigenvector, and then V, which was the imaginary part of the complex eigenvector. Now, once we've done this, what do we do? We can, going from y dot, right? Another way to write y in this case is y is p times r. So y dot equals p times r dot. And what is a y? A y is a p r. These two are equal, so these two are equal. So we've got P R dot equals A P R. Multiply both sides by P inverse. R dot equals P inverse A P R. So P inverse A P, sometimes uh, this is called the, sometimes we'll write this as capital lambda. It's the same, um, it's, it's called a similar matrix to A. So if you've, right, if you've seen linear algebra, this is a routine thing you do, is you can do a transformation to a new basis. In this case, we're choosing the eigenbasis in the hopes that this will give us something simpler. It does. Uh, what is lambda here? Lambda as a matrix is very simple in that it's a block diagonal matrix where the entries will be will, will correspond to the eigen values. So because we chose um, U1 as our first one, this corresponded to plus lambda as the eigen value, and then U2 had negative lambda, and then these two had it had something with plus or minus i nu. 
what you end up getting is this is lambda, negative lambda, and then we have another two by two block down here, which is zero, new, negative new, zero. And then everything else is zeros. So it's nice in that things are very much decoupled, even uh, simpler than our original system. So this is called uh, a block diagonal form. In particular, the way that this was chosen, this is called the Jordan canonical form. And in the theory of linear systems, this would be, this is a common step. So what will we use for R? Um, for R, I'm going to give these names. And the names are, so these, this is the coordinates with respect to the eigenbasis. The first one I'll use C, not to be confused with what we did in the first couple of days with the inertial frame. This is different. So I'll call this C. It's going to be the coordinate along the unstable direction. Eta will be uh, along the stable direction. And then the other two, I'll call them zeta 1 and zeta 2. And they're along the, the direction that is neither stable nor unstable. We'd call those the oscillatory directions. So we've got r dot is lambda r which is really simple if we write it in terms of these things. So let me rewrite it. We have C dot equals lambda C. Eta dot is negative lambda eta. Uh, zeta one dot is nu zeta two, zeta two dot is negative new zeta one. So these are the equations of motion in the eigen basis, and they assume a particularly simple form, right? It looks simple to me, partly because uh, the C dynamics it's totally uncoupled from everything else. The eta dynamics is totally uncoupled from everything else. Uh, these two are coupled, the oscillatory ones, but that's all right. It is what it is. So this would be, yeah, so that's what we get. Particularly simple form. Now, there's some things that we can notice So maybe I'll say, you know, notice. What can we notice? Um, I want us to notice certain constants of motion. Constants of motion are going to play a big role here. In the original nonlinear system, the, the three-body energy is the main constant of motion. It's the only one that we know about. In this linear system, that's this is what's true when you're in some neighborhood of L1 or L2, you actually get additional constants of motion. So you might think, well, that's weird. Things simplify. Whenever you have constants of motion, it means things are moving on lower dimensional surfaces and things should simplify. So um, what can we notice here? We can notice that eta C and zeta one squared plus uh, zeta two squared are both constants of motion. And you could just easily verify that. You could just take the derivative. If we take the total derivative of eta c, we'll get eta c dot plus eta dot c dot. And then just plug in what we have up there. We will get lambda eta 
C minus, uh, yeah, I did something wrong. This should be just uh, that one. Minus lambda eta C. So they just cancel each other out. We get zero. Also, we take the derivative of zeta one squared plus zeta two squared. This will give us two zeta one, zeta one dot plus two zeta two, zeta two dot. And just plug in what we have, two zeta one new zeta two. And then we get a minus, minus two uh, zeta two z, uh, new zeta one. So those two are exactly the same and cancel out. So that's that's interesting. Uh, we have these two constants of motion. Um, we also have an energy function. I didn't say it before, let me say it now. If I go back to the original variables, the, the linearized variables near L1 or L2. What do I have? The x dot is, I think it's 2vy is plus ax. vy dot is negative 2vx minus b y. It turns out that these equations have a, uh, what you might call a local energy that's conserved. And it looks like, well, I'll write it this way, E sub L, just to remind us, this is local. And this is one half VX squared plus VY squared minus AX squared plus b y squared. So that you could verify that it's conserved. I don't really want to do that. If you do d by t, d of e, l, and look at everything, what you'll find is that equals zero. So that means it's it's a conserved quantity. That's in the original variables. If we were to write this same energy function, local energy function, but in the new variables, We'll see something interesting. So in the new eigenbasis variables, if you were to just uh, do substitutions and transform in, let me just give you the punchline. This will be uh, lambda eta c plus one half new zeta one squared plus zeta two squared. So those two conserved quantities from up there should actually show up again in this, this local energy function. And you know, maybe that's, maybe we could use that somehow. Um, yeah, we can. <clears throat> we can use this to do a geometric interpretation of what the, what does the energy surface look like in this bottleneck region near L1 or L2? Well, we've got these four variables, so maybe we should do something with that. Um, I'm going to write this this way so that we've got, I'll write eta going that way, C going that way, and then zeta one and zeta two. Okay. Well, each point, because of this formula up here, 
we know that any point, let me take, say, this point. Any point in the uh, eta C plane corresponds to a circle in the zeta 1, zeta 2 plane. So this point up here would correspond to some circle of a particular radius. Why do I say that? Uh, because we're fixing the energy. The local energy is uh, fixed, meaning it's at, it's at some value that comes from initial conditions. So that means the local energy equals some constant. I'll, I'll call that epsilon. Okay. So... This circle will have a radius. Let me say each point in the 8xc plane corresponds to a circle of uh, radius r that we can calculate in the zeta 1, zeta 2 plane. What is R? R is, well, R squared, two new epsilon minus lambda eta C. So that's just from rearranging this equation up here for the local energy. And depending on the energy, this thing can actually go to zero. So this radius goes to zero. At um, along a particular hyperbole, which would be where this term in the parentheses equals zero. So where would that be? That would be eta times C equals epsilon. So the energy value divided by lambda. If we plot that up here, we get two curves, two hyperbolae. There's one, and then let's say here's the other. So this would be where the radius goes to zero. Right, where radius in the, let's call it the zeta plane, goes to zero. And you can't have a radius below zero. So we could actually uh, color this in kind of like it's a energetically forbidden region because it is. So we have something like an analog of the energetically forbidden regions, but now in this eigenspace. So we'd say this is energetically forbidden. And we have two. This thing doesn't say which one. So we have we have two. It looks a lot like what we have in the position space where you have that bottleneck. But this is just showing up only in the uh, eta C plane. So if we have, um, well, we have formulas for what these curves look like, right? This is eta C equals um, epsilon over lambda. Same for both. So we've got these, depending on the energy, we have these special hyperbolae that you can't go past. Yes, go ahead. There's a question. Uh, Dr. Ross, does this uh, eigenspace have anything to do with the um, monodromy matrix? Yes. Yes, it does. Um, it's... Usually the monodromy matrix is something you look at once you have a periodic orbit, and then you're trying to find what are the directions of uh, instability and stability and also oscillatory directions once you have a periodic orbit. So it's, re it's related, but here we're not talking about the dynamics around a periodic orbit yet. We're just talking about dynamics around an equilibrium point. So the monodromy matrix would be the discrete map analog 
of the, the continuous time dynamics that we're looking at here. Does that help answer it? It does. Okay. Yeah, if there's time before the end of the summer, we might talk about the monojoin matrix for periodic orbits. Um, and it's that's kind of why I went through it this way, because then it, it makes it really easy to just sort of transition to, oh, let's look at the stable and unstable directions near periodic orbits. Uh, but good, good question. All right, so the picture to have in mind is that each point, if I pick some other point, Maybe I've got a different circle. But these points aren't all, you know, kind of on their own. These points are going to lie on a hyperbola. Everything has a is a hyperbola. So everywhere in the um, eta chi plane, there are there be a hyperbola. So here's a hyperbola. Here's a hyperbola. Everything along, say, the red and the blue hyperbole is going to have the same size uh, circle in the zeta plane. In the zeta plane, this actually corresponds to oscillations. This is the oscillatory plane. So I could even put arrows on here. Um, let me try to get it right. If I've got the equations of motion... I think things are actually heading in this direction. So there we go. And right, I drew the red only on one side, but of course there'd be something on the other side too. And there'd be a blue on the other side as well. And everything along those would have the same sort of circle. Once you start building up this idea that, okay, once we fix the energy, each point in the Eta zeta or eta c plane corresponds to a circle in the other plane until it shrinks down to a point, and that shrinking down to a point happens right along these really special probably, and that's that's where uh, you don't have any oscillations in the oscillatory plane. It just sort of shrinks to a point. So that's both of these up here, up at the top and the bottom. And of course, there'd be other hyperbole. Maybe let's say I pick a point there. Um, because that's further away, I don't know, maybe that's a really large orbit. Oops. Or it co corresponds to a really large oscillatory component. Not, um, and then there's a whole hyperbola passing through that. So they'll all have the same size the oscillatory plane. All right, so once we've got that idea fixed in our mind, then we could go to, I think what I'll do for the final little part, which is to try to describe uh, what, the geom what the full geometry of this energy surface looks like. So, There's another thing to notice. Let me let me repeat this energy down here. The local energy is lambda eta c plus one half nu uh, zeta one squared plus zeta two squared. And notice that you could write uh, eta times c. And you might wonder why we're doing this. We have reasons for it. You could write this as one fourth C plus eta squared minus C minus eta squared. That one fourth in front, it'll just sort of, everything will cancel out except the eta times C. So, we could put that in this energy formula where we're already setting that the energy is equal to some constant that we'll call epsilon. And now we could rearrange how we've written the local energy. And we get one fourth lambda C plus 
theta squared plus one half nu zeta one squared plus zeta two squared equals epsilon, so the value of the energy. This is actually the energy above the Lagrange point itself. And this is plus one fourth lambda C minus eta squared. And what we can do is we can def we can define a bottleneck region. I mean, what we sort of want is you know how in the uh, in the original system, right? We've got a Lagrange point, say L one, and we're trying to look at this region. We want to know what's going on here, and it looks like one of the main things is right, we already have these zero velocity curves that form some kind of boundary. What about the other two sides? Well. We could find a correspondence to these other two sides in the eigenspace. So let me let me redraw the eta c plane. We already know that for a fixed value of energy, we've sort of got these, I wouldn't call them zero velocity curves, but they are boundaries to the energy surface. And what we want to do is define a couple of curves, curves that are easy to describe. So I'm just going to draw a 45 degree line from one side to the other here. And then maybe a mirror image, 45 degree line down there. Now the formulas for these, um, I'll try to make it as simple as possible. This is C equals eta, so it has a slope of one, uh, plus the value of that intercept. And let's just call that intercept value. Um, so from here to here, that is C. So another way to write that would be C minus eta equals C. For this line down here, it has the same slope. C equals eta, but the y-intercept will say that's negative C. Or that would be C minus eta equals negative C. Let's just pick one of these and try to figure out what's going on dynamically. Well, we know that at the end points, these big black dots, so I'm looking at the upper curve now, those black points are where in the um, in the zeta plane, things shrink down to a point. And anywhere off of there, we have something like a circle. So maybe I'll just sort of draw, right? This correspond, the two dots correspond to dots, and then everywhere else corresponds to circles. And we actually have bigger and bigger circles as we get further away till we reach some sort of maximum point. And then the circles are getting smaller and smaller and shrinking down. Um, if I were to sort of extract, what am I drawing here? It's going to look like uh, a point and then a slightly bigger circle, bigger circle, biggest circle, down, down. But now imagine the continuum that fits through all these and you, you have a sphere. This is a sphere. So these, that red line that I showed in the four-dimensional space corresponds to a sphere. And we call this a bounding sphere. And it was given by this formula over here. So this corresponds to, maybe we'll call it the left bounding sphere. The same thing is happening on this other one, this other, this lower curve. We've got, uh, you can imagine attached to that curve, attached to that line, we have circles, and then they shrink down to points at both ends and have a fattest part in, in the middle. 
So same kind of deal going on. Circles that get big and then little again. And again, we have a sphere. So this would be what we would call the right bounding sphere. So what about all the lines in between? So if we have eta minus C and we pick some value uh, A, where A is in between negative C and C, that's also going to be a sphere. So every line that's parallel to these 45 degree lines is gonna be some kind of sphere. So it's like we have a continuum of spheres over some interval. So EL equaling to a constant and this eta minus uh, or C minus eta is less than or equal to some constant C where C is positive. This is positive. We would say either you could say topologically or geometrically. This geometrically is a, it's hard to express it. I will write this as S2. It's a sphere cross the interval. And here this interval is you know negative C to C. If you want, if you if you know what an annulus is, an annulus is like the region between two circles. Now imagine that in some higher dimension. Well, now we've got a like a spherical annulus. It doesn't necessarily have a name, um, but the boundaries are kind of easy to think of. You've got two boundaries. So let's say here's the left bounding sphere. And then we've got a right bounding sphere. And what's the significance of this? Well, trajectories, let me get rid of some of these, these green lines. If we have something going from one of the red uh, curves to the other, meaning from one bounding sphere to the other, so there's going to be some hyperbola that goes from one to the other. That corresponds to something that say it enters some point in this left bounding sphere and then it exits some point on the right bounding sphere. Well, that's going to be something that in the original set of coordinates, it transitioned from one side to the other of our Lagrange point. So in our little cartoon, like here's L1, we've got our zero velocity curves. This would be something that went from one side to the other side. And of course, you could have the reverse of that, where something goes from the right bounding sphere to the left bounding sphere. So that's just going the opposite way. What about something that enters the sphere on one side, but then um, it's on a hyperbola that just sort of goes back to that same sphere. Well, that would be something that say entered the left bounding sphere and then left the same sphere. And same thing over here, you could have something that enters the right bounding sphere and then exits that same one. We would call that a non-transit orbit. So it sort of enters and then just sort of goes back to the same side where it started. Right, things that aren't on, on a hyperbola, right? You need that. I'm going to write here on the on the left side. Eta c is a constant, right? That's those are constants of, of motion. Special cases of that are being exactly on, say, the c axis, or being exactly on the eta axis. And if you're on those, those are special trajectories that correspond to an asymptotic orbit to the origin. What I haven't done is actually add arrows in, into here. I should probably do that. So if I have eta, C, C, remember, was the unstable direction. Eta was the stable direction. So 
all the hyperbole have some kind of directions to them. And there's a whole continuum, even if we consider the boundaries just sort of drawn like that. So you could label things as transit or non-transit, or if you have, if in this plane, you pick the origin. So you say A to zero, C zero, that corresponds to uh, the largest possible radius in the zeta plane. And zeta one, zeta two, that is a periodic orbit. corresponding to C eta equals zero, zero. So if you pick the origin in the, we call this the saddle projection, because it looks like a typical two-dimensional saddle point. And over here, this is a center, or uh, it's probably better to call it the oscillatory uh, projection. So you nicely have this four-dimensional phase space decomposing into these two planes. And they're, in some sense, they're coupled through the energy. Was there another question, Dylan? Or is your hand just still up? Oh, sorry, I forgot to put down. Okay. Um, there's there's a nice point of view here that was that's due to uh, Richard McGeehee. He basically took these the the top and bottom um, energetically forbidden regions and said, "Well, suppose we sort of stretch that out, and you can represent things in terms of what's called the uh, McGeehy representation." I think I have a nice illustration of that. Yeah, here it is. So the figure on the left, it's kind of like that saddle portrait. And now we've just sort of stretched things so that if I can draw here, this upper part and this lower part, these are where we, uh, we took that kind of forbidden region and just sort of stretched things out. And then to imagine what is the oscillatory direction doing, you just sort of spin everything about a vertical axis here. So this is showing some vertical axis omega, and you whirl around that, you get this thing that looks like a, we've got the two spheres here. One is inside of the other. In the, in some sense, in the middle is this Lyapunov orbit. And over here, that corresponds to this, this dot, right, it is a black dot. Um, and then there's these special latitude lines along the spheres that actually correspond to the boundary between things that can transit from one side to the other and those that can't transit. This is a static image, but it kind of comes to life if we look at this little video. This is just showing the periodic orbit, that's the Lyapunov orbit, where we fixed energy. And now we're showing the, these are the stable directions along that periodic orbit and the unstable directions, and then showing them both together. And then if we do a cutaway through the whole thing, then that corresponds to this picture that we've been looking at of the saddle phase space, but sort of stretching two sides. But this is what McGeehee did to try to understand what the three-dimensional energy surface looked like in this equilibrium region. You can look at that more. It's in section, I think, section 2.7 of our book. I think that's enough for today. Uh, right? You have to do a lot of things. You're imagining that at points you've got circles. It takes some mental effort. But I, if you can get around that um, and think about it for a while, I, hopefully it'll make sense. So I think I'll continue from here just to sort of describe a, a bit more, because this is sort of the heart of a lot of things, is getting this geometry right. You can extend this to the three-dimensional system. 
So don't think, oh, this only works in the planar case. No, you can extend this to the three-dimensional system. It's just that instead of having to deal with at each point, there's a circle. You have to imagine that at each point in the eta C plane, there's a three sphere. So a three-dimensional version of a sphere. And the bounding sphere becomes not a two sphere, a normal sphere, but a four-dimensional sphere. So you can mathematically describe things, even if you can't easily imagine them. You can get to the, we're just trying to get a handle on, on this so that we can understand the geometry and design some interesting trajectories. So I'm going to stop there. If you appreciated this video, please like and subscribe, or just wait and watch the next video in the series.